Hey, look, man, I don't know what this is all about, but I've dropped out of your gadget civilization. I've renounced all science and zombie takeout. Hello and welcome to Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is a our, Car- our Carol, tri- Ca- if I can say that, our uh-huh. Carol Channing tribute. Um, uh, she passed away last week, um, and we didn't expect to be doing a tribute to her. Until, I, I did not expect us to be doing a tribute. <laughs> until her. I found this movie, and it is from 1968, Skidoo. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by sponsored by Garbage Cans, where a succotash and a piece of hash can get together and have a bash. Her life is always equal in the can. And also brought to you by organic supermarkets. <laughs> like, that'll ever happen. <laughs> anyway, um, so we have a, uh, a retired mobster hitman who is um, it, it very rarely... <laughs> allowed to retire uh, mm-hmm. but he they just when he thinks he's out they pull him back they in. pull him back in and uh it's and at first i thought this was you know a fuck up that you know they would need to bring somebody from the outside of prison into the prison to assassinate somebody because you know the mob has influence in the prison uh but they explain that away that he's in solitary and only his old friend, they believe, would be able to get in to see him. Mm-hmm. And or, they refer to it as giving him the kiss. I'm glad I've seen enough mob movies to understand that. You know, I don't recall ever using that term. But then again, I really don't follow mob I don't either that closely because I, I mean, I don't I'm either. Italian, but I, it's like, yeah, fuck oh yeah, that. true. <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. <laughs> Um, but I, I don't really either, but I have heard enough of references to the kiss of death to understand you sh- it. You shall not see me wear a pinky ring. <laughs> Sam, I am. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, uh, back on the home front, uh, he's suspicious of his wife because Carol Channing, mm-hmm. uh, his wife seems to have gone with every guy. He's, uh, even though it's about, what, 17, 18 years later, he's still suspicious of who the father of his daughter is. But uh, you kind of expect they're not even going to notice that he's missing, but they do. You know, I I think if this were made in a more current era, they probably would have been like, oh, whatever. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So dad's gone. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's still, you know, pathos here. You know, there's still, uh, they they care about him and uh, go on a quest to find out what the hell happened to him. Uh, and of course, what happened to him is he's in prison. He's trying to get the job done. They, because uh, they, they even threaten, you know, what they do with his daughter and stuff if he doesn't. So he is, uh, he's about to go ahead with it when it gets weird. And should point out that both his wife and his daughter go looking for him separately. Yeah, which, which leads to a bit of French farce. Um, well, right, right. Then they wind up getting separated again, and. Um, well, if you ever want to see Ralph Crampton drop acid, yeah, that's you're what it got in weird. for a treat. <laughs> Which means I was in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> so, what a very painfully long acid scene, though, where he uh, he sees all sorts of different things and uh, experiences all sorts of different things. Uh, but acid, of course, is the answer in this movie. Mm. That is uh, how. They well, I mean, if you think of how blatant it is, acid frees them from the prison. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it also ca- causes a guard to see a naked version of the Green Bay Packers. I'm wondering if that was a gay joke. I I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, I kind of, well, let me finish up the plot somewhere. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> So yes, they they uh, they they are freed by acid, and uh, they confront the uh, mobster or god, the Godfather, 
with um, with love and well, music. Um, Tony and uh, the professor, who he escaped with, yeah. um, are in a balloon, converge on the god, the gangster's boat, as the same time as a group of hippies who'd been living with Flo, his wife, Carol Channing's yeah. character. They all converge on his yacht at the same time. Yes, the whole movie comes together on this yacht, and it's a um, it's pretty much an episode of the monkeys. Pretty yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, it's that big chaotic ending you get in a lot of '60s stuff. Yes, and uh, hilarity ensues. That was much more concise than I could have ever expected it to be. <laughs> yeah, just wait if we ever do one of these uh, a drunken episode of this, so we try to do this. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably go on for an hour. Oh yeah. Now, I love that the movie starts with the movie starting on a TV. <laughs> the opening credits, to which Carol Channing says she doesn't want to watch it. <laughs> I, and I wonder, was this a different version of it? For like, you know, was this the version that was on TV? Was there a different version of that scene in the theaters? Um, we mean, found this on YouTube, just full disclosure. Yeah. Um, anybody who would stand to, you know, anybody connected with the making of the film who would stand to make anything is gone. So I don't feel bad about that. Um, and what's really tricky about the beginning, you, th I even write in my notes, what's with movies of this time with awful cartoons starting them off? Yeah. They they start off with the cartoon. You think the cartoon is going to be the intro, and then they just cut it away to that yeah, TV. Yeah. And every decade has its tropes for opening credits. You know, the, the 60s just had that cartoon thing. Um, yeah, and then we get, a bunch of commercials, which really reminded me of Amazon Women on the Moon. <laughs> so well, I was liking this movie a lot from the beginning. The the annoying remote control battle, though. <laughs> that went on way too long. long. Yes, it did. Also, the dialogue at the very beginning was a bit echoey, which was weird. Yeah. They were battling. Basically, it was layered over top of the TV, and it, I, I think they were trying to put an effect on it to make it better heard, but I don't know. It just kind of got a bit echoey. Also, the, the special effects were a bit cartoonish. When they went back yeah. to investigate the car that showed up, they, we just got some bizarre special cartoon effects, or special sound effects, I should say. And yeah. of course, the, in the car is not the mob boss who they thought it would be. It was his, Tony's daughter with this hippie. <laughs> Who she's and planning to run away with. The uh, the big shocker of this movie, though, is hearing Ralph Cramden say the other F word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I, 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 I was, it was like, whoa. <laughs> it caught me, and then I remembered it was 68. I mean, then I thought, remember, Eddie Murphy did a yeah. whole bit. Right. It was a whole bit about him and, and you know Jackie Gleason and and, and uh, Art Carney, you know the honeymooners mm -hmm. as two gay you know right, right. arguing gay guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to hear this was like, wait a minute, is this where Eddie Murphy got the idea? <laughs> it could have been. Now that was your shock of the movie. My shock of the movie was shortly thereafter. Um, Tony sneaks out late at night because he's been pulled back into the mob. Yeah. And we see the two of them, him and, and Flo, Carol Channing's character, in bed. And we see a lot of Carol Channing's leg. Yes. And then just for a second before the camera cuts, I, I swear we saw her hump at the pillow. Oh, yes. And she was moaning some guy named Stanley. Yeah. <laughs> Should mention we grew up in the 80s when Carol Channing was on game shows and already in like her 70s or 60s i mean she was just she's always hello dolly to you know i mean See, to me she's always been the game show person yeah but you know I, she has a very specific sense of humor a particular style i think she showed a lot more range in this one than i was expecting i think i mean i was ex i would expect us to do a tribute because this isn't a broadway podcast or anything but well, you yeah. know uh, but she's in a notoriously bad movie. We have to do it. Yeah. And she really, they really do use her very well in this yeah. movie, actually. I mean, she's in full Broadway mode here. I mean, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. I mean, she did go into full Broadway mode, but she also, as an actor, showed more range than I was expecting. I, I never really thought she was much of an actor, more of a you know, singer, dancer type. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I've, I've never, I, I know I've probably watched. Um, too much sci-fi, 
But in the scene where the the boat left the dock with the, the inmates, I, I thought to myself, that was a really good effect until I realized it was an actual boat leaving a dock. <laughs> It's funny, we just saw, like, they just had the drunk history about Alcatraz mm -hmm. on, and they used, it was like this obvious, you know, blue plastic yeah. bag, and you could see the line pulling the boat mm -hmm. across it. It was really funny. Yeah, this was Alcatraz. I didn't really connect that until just now. Yeah, I don't know if they actually filmed inside It was or supposed not, to be Alcatraz. But the exterior is definitely Alcatraz. And... Richard Keel is one of the inmates. Dude, the cast of this movie the cast is ridiculous. It's fucking insane. Ja uh, Jackie Gleason, Carol Channing, as we mentioned. Hold on. Think um, about this. Think about this. One of the inmates in the prison was the Riddler. Frank Gorshin, great to see him. The warden of the prison is the Penguin. Yes. <laughs> and Cesar Romero was in there somewhere. I missed him. <laughs> right. He's the Penguin, right? Well, no, uh, the Joker, Cesar Romero, was oh, in there as well. The Joker was in there too. Yeah, I, I supposedly was in there. I think I caught him for a split second, but I, he was, he, it was during the trip when you saw the three heads rotating. He was one of them, but I don't oh, know if he had other scenes. Okay, so but yeah, Cesar Romero. All three of them were here. Yeah, um, yeah. And Otto Preminger, the Meredith. and Otto Preminger, the director, played Mister Freeze in on that Batman series. Holy shit! I didn't even think of that. Yeah. So that's why they were all there. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, of one of the better cast members, um, Groucho Marx um, plays God, the, the head gangster. And right. When I saw the daughter, I, I thought it might have been Beverly D'Angelo, and no. I had to go to IMDb to look her up. Mm. And it spoiled I, a lot of the cameos. Yeah, yeah. I unfortunately had to see the trailer, so um, it, it lists her name and um, the, the actor who played Stash, her boyfriend, as you know, it was their first roles. Um, yeah. But on the other side of the equation, this was the final film performance of Groucho Marx. Wow. This was Groucho Marx's last movie. Um, writer Paul Krasner published a story in the February 81 issue of High Times magazine relating how Groucho, Groucho Marx prepared for his role in the movie by taking a dose of LSD in Krasner's company and, <laughs> and having what Krasner called a moving, largely pleasant experience. Singer-songwriter Nelson... Uh, who wrote the score um, and also appears in the movie as a tower guard. Um, and um, he apparently says that he just played drunk. He, did, he wasn't high on anything. Um, <laughs> and Otto Preminger also experimented with LSD to prepare for the film. Well, right. Uh, and I was not expecting all of that in here. Uh, you know, it's funny. I just read the review that Roger Ebert wrote at the time. And he thought this was also blasé, even though this was written. In, his review was written in '68, mm. and I'm sitting here thinking, like, this must have fucking like uh, blown people's minds yeah. to have and, seen this in movies in a mainstream movie in '68. And right now, I'm wondering why neither of us thought of the Fringe reference for the sponsor. I, well, I kind of thought of it, but you know, <laughs> but done, done to death, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Another actor who surprised me was Frankie Avalon, playing very much against type. <laughs> right. As Angie, one of uh, God's underlings. Mm -hmm. And another line, I mentioned, you know, the, I, I kind of made a joke about the gay joke earlier. I don't really think it was a gay joke. Um, but there was a line where Tony Selma, um, can't think of the, uh, oh, Leech, I think his name was, um, is, was talking about how he's a recidivist and he's been in and out multiple times. And he just, he says most of his crimes were rapes. And just leaves it there. Like, it, was it supposed to be a joke? I don't know. <laughs> it is it is kind of weird how it was. Because they're just kind of looking at him like, uh, okay. And he's just kind of like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, and I think up until the acid trip, I, 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 I would say it was mediocre. Most of the movie. It wasn't bad. It was just kind of mediocre. Um, and I think largely because it was trying to juggle too many plots. You know, you had the jail plot. You also had the, the wife and daughter or the wife trying to track him down and the hippies at the house. And it yeah. was just, it was just trying to do too much. It was very ambitious. No doubt about that. But then we get to the trip and it starts getting better and better. <laughs> I don't know what, and they don't explain this, why Tony was cackling at equations during his trip. 
he sees mathematics. Uh, yeah, I don't get that either. Like, why? He also saw God's head on a screw, which was a very interesting message. <laughs> and then about an hour into the movie, we're reminded that the hippies are at their house. Yes. We'd forgotten about them. They, Be they firmly had taken residence there and, you know. Because um, Stash, the, the boyfriend, was on the boat with God. And yeah. he got one phone call, apparently. So we called them the house and was giving them this code for how to find them. Love the code. I love it. Because, yeah, it's it's the whole, you know, these kids and their lingo today, these days. Which, I mean, now I think... It, I, I mean, I guess they did it years later in Airplane. And it was funny yeah, then, yeah. too. But, I mean... <laughs> And, and I love the the inmates and the staff tripping. They decide the jailbreak plan is to is to slip dose some LSD, the entire prison, to dose the entire prison, slip LSD into the food. It worked. Love I seeing imagine it, it would actually. Yeah. <laughs> love seeing everybody trip. Um, they make a point of pointing out that it's odorless, colorless, and tasteless. Um, but the odds of everybody tripping at the same time, well, and yeah. everybody having of, a good of trip, course, of course, very slim. <laughs> Speaking of slim. Slim Pickens was yes. within the prison working as the uh, tell um the the um tell the phone switch operator. And at first I thought they were gonna underuse him, but then he starts singing home on the range. Yes, yes, <laughs> like... it was beautiful. <laughs> and I normally don't like musical numbers in movies, but the singing dancing garbage cans bought it a half a brain. <laughs> One of the most brilliant <laughs> things I've ever seen. I I think I was just I was just jaw dropped. I was just like, "What the fuck are we watching here?" <laughs> That's what it really got good for me. <laughs> Loved the kind of weird balloon contraption they escaped in. It was this big balloon tied to garbage cans. In fact, wait, here are my notes. Wait, what the fuck is this garbage can number? Holy shit, mm -hmm. this got weird. Yeah, it's yeah. an obvious time filler, but wow. But if you're going to fill time, that's the way to do it. <laughs> Dance number of the garbage cans. And yeah, you're right. <laughs> after Preminger saw him perform in the committee, an uncredited Rob Reiner was brought in to write scenes for the hippies. Oh, really? So, you know, not just a great cast, but, you know, a, a heavy hitter on the writing staff. Yeah. Although at the time, not known for to be a heavy right. hitter. I thought they were going to demonstrate just how old the acid trip flying trope you know that we did like last week mm -hmm. <laughs> how that is but they didn't um and of course it ends with this big chaotic mess very um uh what's that movie um the big w when mad 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 world yeah very reminiscent of that um and carol channing has a musical number again i didn't mind it well, because it was just so bizarre. The yeah. whole thing was bizarre at the end. It was just kind of like, but that was the point. It was just, I mean, we're not going to have this fight anymore. Uh, we're just, you know, that that's just it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've decided this is how we're ending it. Because, I mean, there, there's a, a lot talked about, you know, for the pol the politics of the time, too. Yeah. You know, like the like Groucho's description of the mob, or it might have been Frankie Valley's description of the mob, is very similar to how conservatives of the time were talking about why it's necessary to have a police force or, right, exactly. you know, the military and everything. They were all the same arguments. It was kind of like the world would be chaos without this. Right, right. <laughs> and did you watch the credits? Of course. The credits are sung. The credits are the most fucking brilliant part of this movie, actually. <laughs> I'm still partial to the garbage cans, but the credits are second for me. I there's, mean, to have a band. The entire credits are sung. The yes. entire credits. I've never seen that before. No, no. And just after the copyright, one of the singers says, your seat is on fire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the people responsible have been sacked. Yes. I mean, they, they sang the fucking Roman numerals, fam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed the ending credits of a movie for possibly the first time in my life. Uh, I we're mean, we're you talking know, about the ending credits. I mean, you got the like the cannonball run blooper yeah, reel. Okay, yeah. Stuff. There's there's some good credits. I, I mentioned Grail. Or no, is it um, Meaning of Life? 
that I was gonna say Grail had no credits at the end. Right, yeah, it was meaning of life, the people of Insatch, yeah. Um, Grail had all the credits. Oh no, beginning. meaning it was meaning of life. Um Meaning of life. No, that was Grail. Meaning of life. Yeah, had Grail some, had the credits all at the beginning. That was the people responsible have been yeah. Um what was and then they just ended it with everybody getting arrested. Right, right, right. Um, so it was growl. I just wasn't, it was the beginning. Yeah. Anyway, I normally skip ending credits or hunt through them to see if there's an extra scene. Of course, yeah. But yeah, I usually I watch do them. try to look. But then as we're getting into it, you realize, like, wait a minute, what's with this? So then you realize, wait, are they really going to? Oh my God, they're really going to yeah. sing the whole credits to us. And I thought it would be one of those deals where, you know, where they have some gag for the beginning for the first part of the credits where they just introduce the cast of and course. then they just go to the black screen. In the, in yeah, the call. sure. The normal credits. No. So the entire <laughs> the accountant fucking gets like, I mean, everything. <laughs> the copyright notice, the Roman numerals, everything. Yes. yes. Best, best boy. Yeah. Now, one last bit of trivia. Otto Preminger originally wanted Bob Dylan to score the movie. And he invited Dylan and his wife to a screening of a rough cut at his house. Uh, in Hollywood, his, at his mansion. After the screening, Dylan surprised everybody from his entourage who thought the film was a disaster by requesting a second screening, but on one condition. He wanted to be left alone with his wife in Preminger's house during it. Preminger ha happily obliged, uh, convinced that uh, Dylan would accept the job. Dylan showed no further interest in the movie. He acknowledged later that he and his wife were interested, weren't interested in, at all in the film, but they were interested in the mansion and they wanted time to scope it out all on their own. So, you know, to take inspiration for their own place. That is so weird. <laughs> on the sequels and remakes? On, to, on the sequels and remakes. Could this be remade? I don't think so. I mean, this it's is so just... of its time. Yeah. I don't think it would work at any other point. It, it is very much of its time. And, I mean, it's kind of sad to think this was kind of... It, it looks like this was, you know, Jackie Gleason trying to cross back into, you know... And Carol Channing. Mm -hmm. Both of them trying to cross back into movies, you know, from this. Yeah. Unfortunately, it... it uh, I, I want to say it was ahead of its time. It... And it's funny. That's what's so weird about seeing Roger Ebert writing about this like it was all so blasé. And it's kind of like, really? <laughs> He's like, who paint, who body paints anymore? You know, and you know, it was one of his grapes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it was so past its time already. And it's like, it's only 68, man. Yeah. The hippies are into speed, though, is what he was complaining about. <laughs> so on the brains. On the brains. This was mediocre until the trip. I was at <laughs> oh, it was slightly better. I was enjoying it. I was at a yeah. three. I was at a three until the trip. And then between the garbage cans and the sun credits and all of the weirdness, I'm going four and a half. I, I was probably lower before the chaos at the end, so uh, I'm going three. But right. I enjoyed it. And what have we learned? Jackie Gleason isn't nearly conservative as I thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that ugliness is un-American. Mm. And on to some feedback that I unfortunately forgot at the top of the show. Oh, we, yeah, we usually have top. Yeah, I slipped my, I just overlooked it. Um, both from Bodo on Twitter, uh, in reference to last week's episode, uh, ben, a review of Black Mirror Bandersnatch, he said, great, mirror, great job on the Black Mirror video games, video slash game movie. Um, my problem with Black Mirror, uh, the series, is I grew up with Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, and Night Gallery, so every episode reminds me of something I've seen before, so it's not new to me. Now, I, of course, loved the Twilight Zone since I was Same a kid. Same here. Never really got into Night Gallery, even though that's Serling as well. Um, ah, you know, I can't... I may have seen an episode here and there, mm -hmm. and I just never watched it all that and much. And the only Outer Limits... I know I know it was an earlier series, but I really only know the 80s, 90s version, which was... Eh. But I have seen most of Black Mirror, and I think it's on par. None of those fuckers ever did anything like this, though. Come on. <laughs> I, I think Mirror, Black Mirror is is well. That's true. They didn't have the technology. Um, have you I, gone back to uh, watch? Have you not tried yet. It? Not yet. Oh. Uh, um. I think Black Mirror is the successor to the Twilight Zone, though. I think it's the right, yeah. or maybe Night Gallery, since that is wrong as well. I think it's well, it's the rightful successor. One of Key and Peele is rebooting Twilight Zone. Twilight yeah. Zone yeah. Um. Jordan Peele, um, the director. Um. So that I'm curious to see that because he's really good. 
So I'm curious to see where he goes with it. Um, and in reference to this week's movie, Skidoo, um, probably, this may have been better beforehand. Um, <laughs> but I said, Skidoo, only you have Jackie Gleason not hustling. Uh, Carol Channing, diamonds aren't always your best friend. Three Batman villains, Red Lord of Penguin and Joker. Maybe it's better that I read this after because I, I like the way we revealed that. Yeah. Um, Slim Pickens, no bomb riding. And Mickey Rooney, not a Yankee Doodle Dandy. We didn't even mention Mickey Rooney. Yeah, yeah Mickey Rooney is the person. The person he that he was supposed to kill, yeah. Um, yeah, the movie has such a cast that we've overlooked. Uh, Mickey, Mickey Rooney. Um, what could go wrong? Everything. <laughs> But like many, you've mentioned Groucho Marx. Yeah, like many movies we've reviewed, it went wrong in a great way. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, that's it for Skidoo. Until next time, and we'll be reviewing 2019 after the fall of New York. Oh, we're finally beginning the 2019 series. Kicking off six movies in a row set in 2019, a double trilogy. The first ones are B movies. The second one, uh, second set are actually well, movies that were thought to be good at their time. Some are <laughs> legitimately good. Um, the Running Man is one of them. So you know, and is so is the Island. I don't remember the B movies. Um, the other one of the good trilogy is um, um, that Blade, Blade Runner thing. Blade Runner. I how did I blank on Blade Runner? Um, and Roberto will be joining us for that one. Great. Until then, always remember never, next week again, 2019, Fall of New York, starting with the Bean movies. Until then, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you there are. There you are.